Yes, that was recorded. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. We're all spread out tonight. Okay. I can see everybody back there. It's, it must be round table or rectangle preferences. That must be what we're looking at here. It's like if you like the round tables, you're up close. What if you like rectangle tables, but you like being up front? What are you going to do then? It's such a, like if you, if you, yeah, or if you hate being up front, but you love round tables, right? It's a real problem at this point. So, hey, it is so good uh, to see you tonight. Um, are you guys enjoying this so far? This class, is this helpful? Mm. Yes. You, yeah, give Tim and Elaine mm. a hand, all the work they're putting in uh, to, to just being able to share and pour into all of us on Wednesday nights. And tonight, I know, will be no different. Pastor Jason ran over. He forgot the cards from last week as far as questions. That, and so he's going to get those, so maybe we can address some of those toward the end. Um, if you have some still, if as we've been going, you're thinking of other questions or things you'd like for topics you'd like for us to discuss, uh, there are note cards on the table next to the handout. So make sure you grab one, turn that in, and we will try to get that covered at some point throughout the semester. Let me pray for us, and I'm going to turn it over so Tim and Elaine can jump right in and. We can, we can dig into this topic of anger. I know nobody struggles with that, right? We don't know anybody that struggles uh, with anger, correct? So this will just be a, this will just be kind of a, a, an easy week. Easy. Uh, it's just we're going to file this away for later when we meet some people that struggle in this area, right? <laughs> hey, pray with me. Father, we pause right now just to thank you for, for this time. God, I thank you very much for Tim and Elaine, uh, God, for uh, working in their hearts, for God, just the things that you've done in their lives, God, that, um, that have equipped them to be able to share uh, the things you've taught them. Uh, and God, thank you for their willingness to, to turn around and teach us and to invest in us. God, as we look to your word uh, for, for answers to the things that we deal with in life, these common things that yes. each and every one of us struggle with, and we know people who are very dear to us who struggle. Uh, Father, I pray that tonight that you would give us insight uh, that comes from, from your spirit, God, to see things clearly, um, and God, that you would equip us and prepare us uh, yes. for what you have ahead of us. Uh, so thank you again for this night. God, just uh, pray your blessings on Tim and Elaine as they share. Would you just speak to us through them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. Welcome back. Uh, brought my buddy with me here. I, I got out of my uh, quarantine. <laughs> Well, uh, I want us to start tonight with some general guidelines as we approach really any challenge that we face in life from a biblical perspective. And you'll see the questions I have in your outline there. This is just general questions that we would ask about the struggle that we're facing. Number one, what is the problem exactly? Like, what am I struggling with? And name it and be specific about it. Uh, number two, what is God's solution to that problem? Number three, how do I embrace God's solution? Do I need to look up passages of scripture? Do I need to memorize some things? Like, how do I go about embracing God's solution? And then what obstacles might I be facing th that are standing in my way between where I am and where I need to be or where God wants me to be? And then on a personal responsibility level, what choices am I making? Some of these choices we make, we, we're not aware that we're making them. So we need to become aware of the choices that we're making. And then where or, and how can I repent and embrace this new life or choose a different path, make an adjustment in that process so that the outcome would be more life-giving, Christ-like, et cetera. So let's turn our attention to anger tonight. And let's look at anger. So, not all anger is sinful. There's such a thing as righteous anger. I'm sure all of you know that. Um, but anger is a God-given emotion. And I think that anger that we see around us 
distorts what God intended anger to be for. Um, anger is not wrong or sinful, all in and of itself. And the Bible paints anger in a very normal, as a very normal, common emotion that every person experiences. In fact, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 26 through 27, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So notice the command or the directive in this passage. It says, be angry. So the Bible uh, is very clear that God gets angry. Um, in the Old Testament, there are several examples. And then also in the, well, and let me just give you an Old Testament example. In Deuteronomy um, chapter 3, verse 26, God was angry with Moses. And Moses ended up not getting to go into the promised land. But on your own time, look through those passages that we have for you in the handout and look at those examples of how God would have righteous anger. And then the New Testament also brings us several examples. We know that from the Gospels that Jesus was angry. And so much like in Mark chapter 3 and verse 5 when he was dealing with the Pharisees about the Sabbath. And he, you know, he looked at them and he, he was asking questions. And then he says in verse 5, and when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Um, so I think it's interesting too, and we can't get into this tonight, but maybe make a little note in your handout that he looked around at them with anger being grieved. You know, being grieved and anger. Think about those combinations. We'll probably talk about that in another session. Um, keep in mind as we go through this material that there is righteous, the, there is a righteous aspect to anger. And what we see in the world around us is not necessarily always that righteous aspect. But in this session, we are talking about what we normally consider sinful anger or a problem with anger. So starting with a definition, you'll see that the, the term used for anger is uh, defined as glowing or to grow warm. And then you see on the other side of the spectrum is to blaze up. And so there seems to be a potential for gradually moving from a low level of anger to a much more intense level of anger. And I think that's important because many times we only recognize anger when it's in, the, in its intense form. And we say, oh, I must be angry. But if we could catch anger sooner, uh, we will find that we're in a better position to deal with that. And when we have low levels of anger, if we don't address it, then it, it is m more likely to escalate and become problematic. Different variations or expressions of anger are really important for us to know as well. So I ask people all the time, especially guys, I'll say, listen, you, you appear to be angry. Are you angry? No, I'm not angry. You know, I'm irritated. I'm, I'm a little frustrated. And uh, so I think it's important that we realize that all of these uh, levels of anger or expressions of anger are in the anger column, right? So. Being irritated is a very low level of anger. Frustrated, if you're annoyed with someone, uh, this you might think, oh, I'm just, that person's so annoying. You might not think, I'm getting angry because this person's annoying me. Uh, so we, as we get to know ourselves a little better and, and to be able to recognize these lower levels of anger. And many people, as I said about anxiety, many people function at a very high level of anger. So if we had a scale from zero to 10 and someone's functioning at a seven or an eight, that means they're very nice to you until you cross them. And immediately, uh, you know, they, they react and you know, uh oh, I didn't realize that that was going to get you so upset. 
Uh, but what they may not re realize and what you may not realize is they are functioning at, at a very high level of anger that is their normal. And so they don't view it as anger. So it's important that we understand where we are in relation to our anger or our use of anger. And so, as I said earlier, the quicker we can identify when we are getting angry, the better our chance of managing that anger appropriately. And many times we don't know that we're angry until we behave badly. And then we say, oh, I guess I was just angry. And uh, sometimes we use that as an excuse too. But either way, we need to ask ourselves, why am I getting angry? Because that is the great question that we need to ask. Now, you may be tempted to blame someone or something else for your anger. Elaine's going to talk a little bit more about that. Well, anger has different faces, as we all know. And so someone might vent their anger outwardly, and that might include a red face, a harsh words, um, or shouting. And another person might stuff their anger and go along silent and avoid people and brood. But they still express that anger. And many times we relate anger to the venter. You know, when we think of anger, we think of the venter. And we assume that the, suff the stuffer doesn't have a problem with anger. The truth is we all learn habits of dealing with our anger at many, any Many times, our upbringing has a lot to do with that. Um, so whichever expression of anger was acceptable in your family of origin or your upbringing, that is most likely the style of anger that you learn to practice. And this is definitely true for me personally. Um, I was raised in an environment where whoever was the loudest and the meanest and the most aggressive got to be heard. And so I married young, so I, I wasn't out in the world on my own to learn anything different before I jumped into relationship with this sweet guy. And the first months of our marriage were very difficult because I had a lot of things that I was angry about. And I would just blast into Tim and I remember one day in particular, uh, Tim had come home from work and I was expressing myself, expressing my anger. And I'm not really sure, but I don't think it was righteous. Uh, I remember um, I was just, I was so harsh. And Tim turned around and looked at me and he put his finger up and he's never done that since. I mean, that was really weird because he never has done that again. But he put his finger up and he looked at me in the eye and with the most gentle voice, he said, you will never speak to me that way again. And when he said that, it's like the Holy Spirit just pierced my heart. I had never before realized that that anger was not appropriate. That was all I knew. It was a way of life for me. And so the Holy Spirit used that moment for him to speak that truth to me. And from that day on, I made it my personal goal to rid my life of that unrighteous anger. And thankfully, to this day, it's fewer and farther between that I have an outburst. Uh, I can't even remember the last time. And all that glory goes to the Lord. Watch, it's going to happen. No. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, well, Tim came from a, a, a different situation, and he learned to stuff his anger. And so he was very angry, but you could never tell it on the outside. He would find ways to express that anger that was very uh, uh, passive, passive ways of expressing. So the Lord really did a great work in our life to teach us these negative, unhealthy ways of expressing anger. Uh, and for me, my dad was a venter, and I thought that was so wrong. Like, you should not behave that way. And so I made sort of an internal vow that I would never do that. Like, I'll never do that. And I never have. And you can talk to anyone that knows me. That is not something that is characteristic of me. But 
I have been as angry as my dad and my anger has been just as destructive as him, as his was, but it was a different version. And so it was hard for me to identify. The reason I know about these levels and why people choose irritation, frustration, aggravation, is because those were my choice words. It was hard for me to accept that I was angry because I didn't like being that way. When you think about anger, anger um, involves control usually. It's, it's either I want to control the circumstance or you, like I'm using my anger to control you, or I am afraid that you're going to co control me. Like I'm afraid you're going to want to tr control me, so I'm going to be angry as a pr to put up this protective barrier. And one of the reasons why it's so hard to overcome anger is anger really works well. It's kind of like a bulldozer. You know, it's just kind of boom. And, and, and people are very intimidated by angry people. So if anger has worked for you, it's going to be hard for you to let that go. That's a really good tool for getting what you want. So anger usually involves control. It's interesting. We're going to look at this passage later in a different class, but I want to look at James 4, 1 right now. And notice uh, James asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers the question, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but what you do not, you desire but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So James is basically saying, when you don't get what you want, something ugly comes out in you. And you either fight about it or you demand that you get it from the other person. So it has this control component to it that is very destructive. And James is basically, he, if you read the rest of that passage, he just continues to pounce on us uh, because this is a really serious issue. But I think he's pointing out that there's something within us that when we don't get what we want, we, we rise up and we fight about it, uh, whether that is overtly or internally. And I think that's very important for us to know as we're struggling with anger, that there's something going on within us that needs to be addressed. Most people become angry when their rights are violated or they're infringed upon. So, uh, you know, I might be, you might, if you dismiss a person or ignore a person or, you know, reject a person, that person is very likely to get angry. Now, if she's a fighter, she's coming after you. If, she, if, if he, he or she is a flighter, they're gonna withdraw and stuff, but you're gonna get it at some point. Just hang on. Uh, so anger is deceitful. Anger can blind us so that we can't see the truth behind the lies that we're believing. For example, you're driving down the road, someone cuts in front of you, and you start fussing at them. I know none of you would ever do that, but you know, things start happening in the car and everybody gets uncomfortable, and you, when, when your spouse might ask you, why are you so angry, you'll say something like, well, I wouldn't be if they hadn't cut in front of me. So we pass that blame onto the person cutting in front of us. Or uh, you might have heard this before, I wouldn't have gotten angry if you had remembered to pick those items up. So again, it's you not picking those items up that's made me angry. Then I might not have gotten angry at that restaurant if there had not been so much incompetence that infringed on my time and my meal. You know, it's like it's someone else's fault. So we tend to justify anger when, we're, when our own rights are violated. Whether the retaliation is to lash out or attack or go silent and brood, anger is deceiving us and causing us to justify it. So we justify placing blame for our anger on the person who violated our rights. And really, when you think about it, it's irrational thinking. It's irrational th to think that I don't have an anger problem if I do these things. 
The way I'm thinking implies that I'm not responsible for my anger. And I am responsible. And my sinful anger is my responsibility. And it doesn't matter how anyone around me behaves. I choose how I display anger. I have to accept that personal responsibility. I can't control someone cutting in front of me, but I can control how I respond. So it's the Holy Spirit who confronts that in us and shows us our sin. And we have to remember that. Hmm. So back to our question, why, why do we get angry? Uh, let's look at a familiar story out of Genesis 4. And this is Cain and Abel, actually Cain and God. Uh, starting in verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of, of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, we've already pointed out that God is in the habit of asking these questions. You know, in Genesis 3, Adam, where are you? Who told you you were naked? Uh, these are great questions that, that we get from the Lord. And here God is asking Cain, why are you angry? Now, if Cain were to talk about it, maybe he would have said, well, I'm angry because you didn't accept my offering and you rejected me. Like, that's why I'm mad. That's wrong. You shouldn't do that. But he didn't, he didn't say anything. And, but God says, if you would do the right thing, you would be accepted. But he noticed, uh, I want us to notice how he points out things about anger in Cain. There's so much we could, we could talk about in this, the dynamics in this conversation. But just let me point out some principles here. Number one, God knows when you're angry even if you don't know when you're angry. He knows when you're angry and he knows why you're angry. So the, the question, why are you angry, has a powerful effect on us if we are open to it. Uh, number two is anger affects us physically. He says your countenance has fallen. I mean, you know, you, if you've ever been angry, have you ever looked at yourself when you were angry, by the way? It's a shocking thing if you happen to Somebody takes a picture of you or you look in the mirror. It's like, that is not me. No, that's you. It, it, because anger affects us physically. In fact, WebMD reports that chronic long-term anger has been linked to health issues such as high blood pressure, heart problems, headaches, skin disorders, and digestive problems. In addition, anger can be linked to problems such as crime, emotional and physical abuse and other violent behavior. It affects us. So we need to realize that sin in and of itself desires to dominate us. It wants to control us. It wants us to be totally um, submitted to it. These habitual sins that we have and tonight we're talking about anger. So God holds us responsible. You're responsible for yourself, you're responsible for your sin, and you're responsible for your anger. And to overcome anger or any other sin, we have to call it what it is. Uh, we cannot overcome sin without naming it and calling it out. We have to identify what we're struggling with. You know, we hear people say, when they go through addiction recovery, it wasn't until I admitted I was an addict that I could begin to work on my addiction. And what we don't realize is our society puts a lot of emphasis on drug, alcohol addiction, other addictions, pornography addictions, but rarely do we hear anybody talking about anger addiction. But if you've ever lived with someone who's addicted to anger, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, and this brings us to the personal responsibility piece, and that is 
we, we make choices. And sometimes, you know, we talked about anxiety and sometimes it feels like anxiety is, is attacking you or it's coming upon you and you really have little power over it and you just are experiencing that attack, so to speak. And this feels the same way. Once you enter that zone where you're reacting, you cannot think yourself out of that. You, but you are making choices. And it, again, to Elaine's point, it does no good to say, well, if you wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't be so upset. That is totally irresponsible for us to, to say things or even think things like that. Uh, the other thing is sinful anger is a heart issue. Uh, so when I was trying to identify my anger and I began to think, okay, I, I need to really learn how to identify this before it becomes a problem. I had to realize that there was something deeper than the behavior. There's something deeper than the behavior. The behavior was an out product, uh, a byproduct of what was going on on the inside. So sinful anger is a heart issue. Jesus said this as he rebuked the religious leaders of his day, Matthew 12, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. And so here's one of the excuses I hear a lot in the counseling room. Uh, well, I, I didn't really mean that I was angry. And I know that that's a sincere remark, but the truth is you actually did mean it. It, it, it didn't just come out of thin air. It came out of you. Now, you don't, maybe you don't like that, and maybe you don't want that to be the case, but if you're going to face the reality of what happened, you got angry, you made a choice to mistreat someone, and that's just what happened. Now, that's not to you know, badger you, but that's to help us to see that we have personal responsibility. And excuse making is not a path to healing or freedom. So we have to own that. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of our heart, uh, the mouth speaks. Another point is sinful anger is destructive. And Jesus kind of reveals the underbelly of anger. He said, well, anger is not that bad. Oh, if you're on the other side of it, it's really bad. So Matthew 5, 21, he says, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And then he goes on. The, the point that Jesus is making is that somehow anger is connected to murder, just as lust is connected to adultery in this same context. If there's anger in my heart, unjustifiably, if I have no cause to be angry, and God is the one who makes that judgment, uh, and I am retaliating in anger, that is within the same family as murder, right? So that is the underbelly of anger. That's how destructive it can be. And this is why uncontrolled anger can destroy our family, it can destroy our children, and all the relationships in our life. Um, let's just talk about the manifestations of anger, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but let's be real specific. Uh, sinful ways that we exhibit anger, um, number one is venting just blowing up, shouting, cursing, throwing things, and so forth. Lashing out, accusing others, blaming others, and so on. Internalizing, clamming up, withdrawing, doing the silent treatment. Pretending to not be angry and denying it. Or brooding, thinking about it, nurturing it, and growing bitter. This is all a result 
of our flesh and our flesh's desires. You know, in Galatians 5, we learn about the fruit of the Spirit, and self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Sinful anger is just a product of our flesh, our old sinful nature. In Colossians 3.8, Paul says to put off anger and wrath. So choosing anger as a way of handling a difficult situation is a form of self-reliance. We're, we're saying, I've got this, and look at how we've got it. We, Tim mentioned earlier, I have this control. I can control this. I can make what I want to happen, happen. So it's an indication that we're not surrendered to the Holy Spirit when we choose anger. And so we need to identify the opportunities that arise so that we can ask for forgiveness and repent and do it God's way. So we've seen some of the sinful ways of dealing with anger, but how does scripture teach us to deal with anger? Uh, well, my favorite passage is what we'll look at here. That's Psalm 37. And uh, we're going to go through verses 1 through 8 where the psalmist says, do not fret. And that's that word, to grow warm or to blaze. Do not fret because of evildoers, uh, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. How many of you watch the news and you get mad? <laughs> that's kind of what he's talking about. Uh, don't. Don't fret when you see these things happening because in your mind, they're unjust. Verse two, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And then he says, don't do that. Like, don't fret, do this. Kind of like what, he, what Paul says in, in Philippians four. He says, number one, trust in the Lord. Number two, do good. Dwell or abide in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. More directives. Delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Number five, uh, verse five, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. In other words, if you've been mistreated and you're being blamed for something you're not guilty of, God's going to bring that to light. He's going to bring forth your righteousness. Uh, verse seven, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. So notice, much like Paul's approach to anxiety, where he says, don't do that, do this. This is exactly what we're reading in Psalm 37. Instead of fretting and letting that anger just churn in you and grow in you, do something different. And he gives all of these directives that are very possible. Uh, I'm positive. And so as an assignment, I regularly ask people to go through this psalm and actually write down these things that we just read. And it's when you, when you start writing this down, it's very convicting. It's like, I'm angry. Yeah, but can you delight yourself in the Lord while you're angry? No. Can you rest? No. Can you uh, commit your way to him? No, you can't do any of that while you're angry. So in order to, uh, to do these things and obey the Lord in this passage, you have to forsake anger. You have to turn away from it and you do these things. And so as you make this list of these directives and you realize, oh, these are some things that I need to focus on uh, in the middle of this challenging circumstance. It, it focuses your attention on life-giving things, on productive things. Anger doesn't do that. Anger doesn't give you any life-giving things. Um, and so here, here is what uh, the psalmist is teaching us. Focus on what you can do. This is a big mistake that we make. We focus on what we can't do. We, we focus on what we don't have control over or power to do anything about. And, and we focus on that and it just really upsets us. And so the psalmist here is saying, focus on the things you can do and, and, and don't focus on the things you can't do. The other thing I recommend is to take a kind of a piece of paper and draw a line down the center and on one side, just write down the things that you can't do. 
the things you don't have power over, things you can't do anything about, list those specifically. And then on the right side, in that column, write the things that you actually can do. And you're gonna find that there's a lot of stuff you can do. And so as you begin to focus on that, you reduce the impact that anger is having on you and you're able to counteract it with life-giving uh, obedience. And the Holy Spirit just really empowers us to do that. Another thing that we can do is familiarize ourselves with what God's Word says about anger. I'd like to just share a few passages with you that can be very encouraging or very convicting if we're struggling. So let's look at Proverbs 15, verses 1 and 2. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. Proverbs 15, 18, a hot-tempered man or woman stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contentions. Proverbs 14, 29, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And finally, Ephesians 4, verse 26 through 27. Be angry, that there's that command again, or that directive, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And there's a big connection there between giving Satan a foothold and choosing anger. Because as Tim said earlier, anger develops and progresses and becomes very harmful and destructive and for some even unto murder. So let's look at some action steps that we can take after hearing all of this because I know this is one of those tough, tough nights where we all are just really challenged in our, you know, we're looking in the mirror and we're seeing ourselves and let's pay attention to when we're getting angry identify our anger and bring it to the Lord in prayer. Ask ourselves, why am I angry? Tim told us about that earlier. Have my rights been infringed upon? Do I feel judged? Am I being dismissed or ignored or rejected? Do I have a good reason for being angry? Can I wait to respond instead of reacting? You might think of other good questions to ask yourself, um, but if anger is justified, prayerfully seek a time to respond appropriately. And you can do that by maybe just overlooking um, something. You just ask yourself, can I overlook this? If not, plan a time when you can confront it in a right spirit, with a right attitude. I think we err mostly on the side of unrighteous anger. And many of us don't know when the righteous anger is there, we often don't know really what to do with it because we think it looks the same. And I think when we start applying ourselves to have righteous anger, we'll see something different. And we'll cover more about resolving conflicts in another session that we're gonna do. Uh, let, me, let me just point out that Ephesians 4.26 passage, be angry and, and do not sin. I remember one day uh, I was reading that and it's like the Holy Spirit said, okay, I said, be angry. And it's like he said, okay, stop right there. Stop right there. Do you know how to do that? And I'm like, no. I don't know how, I won't even allow myself to be angry, or at least in my own estimation. I was angry, but I was stuffing it and denying it. So I had, to, I had to learn how to be angry and not sin in my anger. I didn't know how to do that. That was a long process for me. So I don't know, that might be a process for some of you. 
uh, let me introduce what is sometimes called the sin cycle. We see this in the book of Judges. We see this in Psalm 107. We see it in different places in the scriptures where, uh, you know, we get in trouble, God re- delivers us, and, and then we get in trouble again. After we cry out to him, he, he rescues us. But when you think about uh, any addiction, any life-dominating sin, uh, usually this is the case of being caught in this sin cycle. So basically, you can see how you commit a sin, and then the Holy Spirit brings conviction, and you're grieved by it, and you, you're aware, oh man, I have sinned, and, and then you are sincerely sorry, like you're regretful, and that sorrow leads you to come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, and First uh, John 1.9 says he forgives us and cleanses us of unrighteousness. And that forgiveness is real. It is, when we come to him and ask for forgiveness, it is gone as far as the east is from the west. However, if we do not repent, it's just a matter of time before this cycle starts again. And we are going to be tempted. We're going to sin. We're going to feel that conviction. And this, this cycle can repeat itself literally for years. So what we're having is a very sincere person, a Christian person who is caught in a pattern of sin and doesn't know how to get out of it. So obviously, uh, repentance is what is needed to get out of that cycle. Uh, So technically, the person who's caught in this cycle technically is free, truthfully is free. Jesus has paid for for our freedom, right? Now, but we have to learn how to walk in that freedom. And we only do that as we walk in obedience, as the Holy Spirit leads us with his word. So listen to how Paul explains this in Galatians. I must not have that passage up here. That's all right. I think it's in your notes. Uh, He says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So there's this battle going on in the life of a believer. There's the old man and and the flesh that is saying he deserves it. Give it to him. Boom. And then there's the Holy Spirit in you saying, dude, don't do that. That is not Christ-like. What are you thinking? Probably use different words. But this battle continually rages within us. And basically, Paul is saying, we get to choose. We get to vote. Where will I cast my vote when I have that choice? And he says, if we walk in the Spirit or after the Spirit, we will not give in to the power of the flesh. And that is something that um, will take some, some work, right? So I, I personally wasn't able to identify that my passivity, because that's what would happen. I would use passivity as a tool, as a weapon. And that, lo- that didn't look bad. It really didn't look bad at all. It didn't look like I was be- misbehaving. But if you're on the other side of that, how does it feel? Not too Not good. Too And so it was, I realized um, one day the Holy Spirit just basically saying, you see that passivity? You don't want to, you don't want to engage her. You don't want to have that conversation. She brings it up and you create, you know, create a diversion and you talk about something else. He said, all of that is sin. You're choosing to protect yourself by being passive. And I'm like, wow, that's horrible. But I didn't know I was doing it until the Holy Spirit revealed that to me. So uh, my choice to sin, as I said earlier, started way before the behavior showed up. It started internally. So repentance comes in three processes. We identify the old, we renew our mind, and we, we put on the new man that's created in the image of Christ. But Paul lays out in Philippians, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, some examples of what true repentance looks like. Um, And he says, verse 25, put off lying and speak the truth because, here's the motivation, because we're members of one another. Put off anger 
and deal with things promptly so that you not, don't give place to the devil. Put off stealing, put on honest work. And so somebody asked the question, when is a thief not a thief? And somebody answered, well, when he stops stealing. But truthfully, a, a thief can stop stealing but still be a, a thief. And when the opportunity uh, comes, he, he's going to steal because he's a thief. So a thief is, is not a thief, not only when he stops stealing, but when, according to Paul, when he goes to work and he begins to give to others. So he moves, he's transformed from a taker to a giver. And so in the context of anger, put off anger, it's not enough to just not be angry. We have to become something else. We have to learn how to deal with things promptly. We have to learn how to speak the truth. We have to be, learn how to be kind and gentle and understanding and patient. Those are the replacements for anger. And so we can see, you know, as he gets to verse 31 and 32, put off bitterness, rage, anger, slander, put on kindness, compassion, forgiveness. Why? What's the motivation? Because Christ has loved you that way. He's forgiven you that way. So let's summarize. Uh, anger is a God-given emotion that can be beneficial in many ways. However, when we use anger for selfish purposes, we end up doing damage to ourselves and others. And God expects us to control our anger and not allow it to control us. There are appropriate biblical ways of dealing with offenses and disappointments, and we need to learn what those are. Thank you. Oh, well, you guys don't go too far. We're going to ask you questions. This was great. This was great. This is the fun part. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you, you had talked about uh, righteous anger and sinful anger. Um, so help us think through a good working definition for how we can know when we've crossed those lines, right? And, and when uh, whatever we're thinking about has, has, has gone from, oh, okay, this, this, is, this is an okay category, uh, and, and now I'm in an unhealthy category. Tim's nudging me. Since I have so much experience with the unrighteous, um, <laughs> I will just say that, that <laughs> when when we apply, when we have God's word in our heart and we know that God's word teaches us that we are to do things that edify and build up um, and help one another, serve one another. When something comes out of us that is the opposite of that, it's pretty clear that it's not of God. And so it's, it becomes very apparent. And typically you can look at the face of the person you're talking to with your anger. And that's a, a, a sure sign. You can look at their countenance because their countenance will drop. Um. Yeah, and I would just add uh, that the question, why am I angry? Mm -hmm. Be because if we're honest with ourselves and we say, okay, I'm really angry. If you offend me, I take it personally and I protect myself, I defend myself. That's usually not righteous anger, but if, Something has happened and it is just wrong and it's hurt someone else and you, it has nothing to do with you and you feel this anger rising up with you. I would say that's probably righteous anger. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's it, because it's, it's focused on something that's unjust or, you know, wrong or harmful or something like that. Yeah. So, so really we're saying, let's start with the question, why are you angry? From there, you can have either righteous or unrighteous reasons for why you're angry. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have an unrighteous reason, surely your actions are gonna be unrighteous as well. Uh, but even on the righteous side, you may have just cause 
for why you're angry, but then there's the next question of then now, how are you expressing and controlling uh, that anger and, and what it's looking like and producing on the, on the flip side? Yeah, so to be angry, uh, that's a challenge for some of us, but to not sin in our anger, I think that's where, to Elaine's point, I have to kind of think about how should I address this? This has to be addressed. And I need to do that in a way that is respectful, probably firm, and, you know, but productive in a way that, that you can communicate in a very loving but frank way. You can't do that. Like, that's not okay. So, Tim, you, you are, uh, you're the stuffer. I'm uh, a stuffer as well. Uh, I'm probably better than you. I've <laughs> been doing it a long time. Uh, <laughs> how, how do, how do uh, stuffers realize? So there was a question at the end, like, can we just let it go? Mm. Or does it need to be addressed? Uh, mm, that's a great how, question. How does a, how does a stuffer know know that line because naturally right our tendency is going to be let a it conflict go. avoider let like, it go i'll just let everything go i'll never deal with anything right yeah uh, now it obviously helps when your spouse is wanting to address it right uh but right. if that's not the specific answer yeah what have you learned has there been any keys that have helped you learn uh when uh the lord genuinely wants you to address things yeah because if i say i'm just going to let that go and then i keep thinking about it Obviously, I haven't let it go. It's still bothering me. So I think that's, for me, that's probably the, the thing that helps me. I would like to say something yeah. to that. When Tim first started being honest about his anger, and we agreed, like, I longed for his honesty because it was very apparent to me that he was stuffing. And I longed for him to tell me what he really felt but it was very difficult for him. And when he first started, it was brutal. Like he, he didn't have any tact. He didn't, like he didn't know how to do it. And so I had to be patient and let him fumble and let him mess up and then just encourage him. I, I know I, I would say things like, wow, that was harsh. <laughs> But he was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get it out. I mean, it's that difficult for a stuffer. So I was trying to create a safe environment for him, and he was struggling to do it. And so now, after many years of exercising those things, I think we do much better. I think it's very rare that he stuffs, and it's very rare that I have an outburst. But that came through a lot of work. And going back to the question of why am I angry, for me, I was able to find the root cause of my anger was pride and perfectionism. Um, everyone was doing something to me. They were messing up my plan. And, you know, I had, I had a plan and it wasn't working, you know. And when I would mop the kitchen floor and little children would spill milk all over right when I walk out, I felt like that was being done to me. And so I had to change the way I believed about things. And I had to realize that my thinking and my beliefs were unhealthy and really false. And so I would have to apply truth to those incidents and say, this is a child making a mistake, and there is no reason for me to take that personally and react. And besides, it's just a floor. It's not a big deal. And you know, that's a pretty minor example, but I think that can be brought to, to larger things. And when we, when we decide that we're gonna reject somebody and say ugly things to them because they didn't do things our way, you know, where's the mutuality in that? Where's the love of God in that? So, you know, there's just a lot of dynamics. Mental gymnastics is what I like to call it because our minds have to be renewed to God's word so that we can do the work in our mind and it can translate to our hearts. 
Sorry, that was a little you know, Jason, Very that good. Kind of, it's that kind of honesty that y'all have, it deepens your relationship to one another. I, 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 I shared a particular defect of character of mine with Jason not too long after he first got here. And it's deepened my, uh, deepened my appreciation for him and his listening and being there with me in the struggle that I've had. And, and, and that's... Yeah, if you couldn't if you couldn't hear at the back, what Mike was just saying is that when when you get open and honest and vulnerable with each other, uh, the, the, there's there's uh, I mean the 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 picture in Scripture is the metaphor of being able to be naked and unashamed before mm -hmm. one another, to be completely exposed. And uh, and Elena, I, I love that example that you gave in in. Uh, in the, the line of questioning, right? Uh, one of the things that, that we see naturally in life is like when you ask the question, why are you angry? Oftentimes, like we just get that immediate surface level uh, answer, right? Well, because they did this, that's why I'm angry. Uh, but then to ask those, those mm -hmm. deeper questions about, yeah, but why is that causing so much in you? Mm -hmm. you, you must be holding on to that in a special way. Uh, and that's really whenever you're gonna start to do genuine work uh, in your soul and you realize that, that the Lord is, is, he's working on you, right? He's pulling these things out and we're dealing with perfectionism, right? And now we can go right back to the scripture. I'll just tell you up front, uh, uh, one of the major things in my own life has always been uh, this idea of, of winning. And uh, um, if you don't know, I'm highly competitive. Uh, and uh, th there, there is a root cause of, of uh, a falsehood that I've always believed where uh, I had, my identity was wrapped up in winning and I, I would win at all costs. And, uh, and, and then once that finally got exposed, then I could, I could uh, answer it with the truth, and that is, well, Scripture, God defines winning completely different than the way the world defines winning. Yeah. And, and then that's how I renew my mind. And, and that's the only way that you can address those, those deeper issues, right? Uh, many times that anger will be real surface level, and you'll be, well, because they were an idiot. That's why I'm angry, right? You, you've got you've to keep digging and, and realize uh, perfectionism, the... Uh, uh, the the winning piece in me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one other thing about what might be below that is uh, this a, a victim mentality. Like, if I think everybody's against me, mm -hmm. and so you might make a honest mistake, but I interpret it as, oh, you did that on purpose. You you know you did that on purpose, or you won't say that, or you think that, and then you you're angry toward a person. For, and they don't even know they offended you, uh, because, but you're angry with them. And that's another version of not really understanding and, and taking personal responsibility. All right. So I've got one. We're going to turn it just a little bit because a lot of this tonight has been really good because there's been a lot of right our, our, in ourselves. Is it making right? you no, angry that we're No, we're this is so good because I'm, I'm the stuffer too. And, and <laughs> The, the passage in Proverbs 14, whoever is slow to anger mm -hmm. has great understanding, but he who is, has a hasty temper, right? They're the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I kind of rested on my, you know, my spiritual I pride. So, of, well, I don't have a hasty temper unless it's on the basketball court. Um, <laughs> and other than that, I'm pretty calm. Uh, I'm, and so I thought that I'm slow to anger, right? I thought just because... I don't have a hasty temper. That must mean by default, I'm slow to anger. And God had to work that out. And he's like, no, you're still quick to anger. You're just good at hiding the anger. Mm -hmm. Like those aren't just because you're one doesn't mean you're not the other. That was really helpful. So, but got to move on from that. Cause those are all the self questions. I want to ask one. Um, you said something earlier about people go around like at, at a level, right? If one is completely calm and 10 is like ready to melt down and explode, mm -hmm. right? We don't know where people just are normally, right? When they wake up in the morning before anything has happened that day. So it could take a lot to set you off or it could be the slightest little thing that that, that anger kind of erupts. So when we maybe turn it now off of ourselves and think about people in our lives that maybe we could come alongside and help deal with these things, how do we help them see 
that maybe the root thing that has them living at this level of like an eight so that somebody that does cut you off in traffic just makes you completely lose it. How do we help them begin to see, no, there's a lot of things already in your cup that have you ready to just spill over. Mm -hmm. What would you, how could you help all of us know how to start helping someone process through what's going on to start bring that down? So that they're not always. At well, that's a level. that's a complicated question. Uh, Good. Getting back to, getting back to what Elaine shared on, on anxiety. When I, the entry gates. What was that on? That was something else. Anyway, looking for an entry gate. You're looking for a way to step into that person's life, uh, and so it would just depend. In my opinion, it would depend on just waiting for that moment where you can ask a good question. Uh, maybe, you know, you seem angry. Or are you angry about that? And just wait and see what, what they say. And if they say uh, not really, maybe a little, then you need to let them know how they're impacting you. That's, the, that's something Elaine helped me with. She said, can I tell you how you're impacting me right now? I'm like, okay. Uh, because I was not aware of how I was impacting her. And so sometimes just an honest question to bring that to that person's attention that it, it really is, uh, I'm uncomfortable with you right now because you say you're not angry, but it's, it's coming across to me very angry. And that's one way, I think. I, I, think, I think what we're doing tonight is another way. I think educating people mm -hmm. about sin and about what is sinful and being in the word and making sure that we're holding one another accountable you know accountability was a huge factor in me overcoming anger um, and believe it or not i used my little girls to help me with that um, at that time i probably only had two but i said to them if i am disrespectful to you you can be disrespectful to me. And so that held me accountable to speak to them and communicate to them in a way that was not disrespectful. And there were times when I was, and you better believe one of those girls <laughs> said to me, well, well, actually what she said to me in that moment, and this is branded in my heart and mind, she said, mommy, do you want me to talk to you that way? Because she didn't want to talk to me that way. And so that was so convicting. Um, and the other thing too, is the Holy Spirit is the worker. He's the one who reveals. I tried for a very long time to convict him. And he, he did a good job. The Holy Spirit used him to convict me, but I tried to do that work but it wasn't until he came under conviction from the Holy Spirit that that was a completed work, a good work. Because when I did it, it was just him conforming. But when God did it, it was a heart work. Hmm. That was great. You guys give them a round of applause. Oh. Uh, I'm going to tease you with a question, but I'm going to give you a whole week to think about it so you can, you can answer it. Uh, someone wrote in last week. It was specifically on anxiety. I think it will apply to anger as well. The, the question is, is uh, can we, uh, like, is anxiety or anger, is that something that we can, that we can pass down? Um, uh, I think the, the question often is, is in like generational curses or things that get passed down um, and, uh, and, and or can you create it uh, much more prevalent within your family and your children um, and, and then what are, what are some things that, that you can do to stop that? Okay, Great question. so you guys think about that. Let me pray for us. Uh, again, please write your questions on the card. Um, uh, let, let me give a, a, a quick thing. Uh, some of the questions that have come in, they're great, but they're personal, and they're not particularly appropriate for me to read over uh, the loudspeaker. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, just writing your name on it, if it is more personal, I would be super happy to reach out to you and answer some of those questions specifically versus in this context. All right, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. 
uh, for uh, your word and, and its teaching and, and the use of, of Tim and Elaine in an incredible way this evening. Uh, and yes, your word convicts us, uh, but what we love about your word is if your spirit is convicting us, you are at the same time uh, healing us and equipping us yes. uh, to, to walk out in victory and in a changed life. That through Christ Jesus, uh, we have no reason to fear, uh, but we can trust that you can deal with all of our messiness uh, and, and continue to transform us. So renew our minds and help us to put into practice what we have learned this evening, Thank you. Uh, especially yes. about anger and to ask good questions to ourselves. Why am I angry? And may the Holy Spirit lead us into truth, God. Not yes. even just surface level truth, but deeper truth about our hearts and what we are believing and trusting. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here.